So I've previously reported on the relationship between protein intake and bone density. We know that there is a linear relationship. The more protein you consume, the higher your bone mineral density is gonna be if you look at large populations. But when you talk about protein, you end up talking about concerns around cancer and kidney health and you know is your igf1 going to go up and you'll hear influencers like uh brian johnson and david sinclair say like oh and we got to hold back and we got to keep our protein low so our igf1 comes down and it's really really confusing so what i want to do in this video i want to go over a couple of clear things about uh, protein in kidneys protein and longevity and see if we can come to some consensus about what to do especially if you have osteoporosis or if you have declining bone mineral density, even if it's osteopenia for now, but it's still headed in the wrong direction because there's some very, very clear recommendations that we can make based off of the literature. Obviously, I'm not telling you what to do, especially people that have chronic kidney disease. Please talk to your own doctors, but we're gonna talk about the research. So there was this study that was shown to me recently from 2024, so a recent study. And basically what they were doing is they were taking this really big study called the, the Nurses Health Study, and they used the data points from there. And uh, they looked at dietary protein intake in midlife and then related that protein intake to healthy aging because they followed this cohort for a very, very long time. So in this study, again, big study, almost 49,000 women, they were all under the age of 60 in 1984, and they were followed for 30 years. So it's a really big cohort, right? And then again, they were looking for healthy aging. And the way that they defined healthy aging was to be free of 11 major chronic diseases. And, and one of those was kidney disease. They were also looking for cognitive, physical impairments, and good mental health, okay? So what did they find? They found that higher protein intake was significantly linked to a better odds of healthy aging. And what they showed is basically is that the more protein you consumed, the better off you were. And then they broke it down by total animal, dairy, and plant protein. And they actually found that plant protein had the highest impact. So don't get too excited. This is controversial, but they just said, they said plant protein had the best impact and the more calories, especially from carbohydrate, you move into the protein side, the more likely you are to live with quote unquote healthy aging. So remember that in cohorts like this, people that are choosing to eat a high amount of plant protein or follow a vegan and vegetarian diet are probably also doing other activities that are healthy. This is called the healthy user bias. So remember that animal protein often associated with worse diets you know people that eat hamburgers often also eat milkshakes and so uh, we don't want to read too much into that and before we go on to the next study let me just point out again they were looking for kidney disease and they didn't find it right so in this large group young women as they aged higher protein intake had no impact on diagnosis of kidney disease. Now, the second study is another 2024 study. This is a meta-analysis looking at over 150,000 people and looking at their protein intake and comparing it to chronic kidney disease uh, diagnosis. So higher total plant animal protein, what did that do as far as a diagnosis of chronic kidney disease in these participants? So the results of the study were compelling because not only did they not find that there was an association of higher protein intake and chronic kidney disease, what they found is actually the opposite. Higher total and plant and animal protein was associated with a decreased risk for chronic kidney disease as a diagnosis. So the more protein people ate, the less chronic kidney disease they had. What was interesting in this study though is that they actually found that plant protein as a subgroup was associated with with an increased risk of chronic kidney disease. And so let me just speak on that for a second. So how could that be? Well, I think it has to do with the different ways that you can consume plant protein, right? There is a way to eat a vegan and vegetarian diet that is a whole foods process that is, you know, coming from good sources and has adequate protein and you, you can do it. It's not easy, but you can certainly do it. But then there's also the highly processed garbage food version of eating a vegan diet. And those are also considered plant proteins, of course, but obviously lower quality. And those people that are consuming that food are potentially going to have um, other negative health consequences. So I think that's what we're seeing here is that within the group of people who are consuming a large amount of plant protein, 
you're gonna get a lot of different versions of that diet. Okay, so clearly in these two big studies, protein intake does not impact the diagnosis of chronic kidney disease as long as you don't have kidney disease. Okay, and we'll get to people that do. But before that, there was a study that popped out to me about death in eating more protein. So this is probably important, right? Because you've been told over and over again, likely that if you're eating a quote unquote high protein diet, that you're gonna die sooner, whether it's from cancer or some other malady, but a high protein diet can't be good for you. Well, there's a study on that. So this study is a 2022 study, and this is on the NHANES database. And we use these famous databases because they're just massive and you can pull a lot of data out of them. But basically the NHANES database was asking the question, does observing a low protein intake, which is less than 0.8 grams per kilogram, does it protect from mortality, death, in participants based off of their kidney function? And so now we're gonna talk a little bit about kidney function. We're gonna use words like creatinine and EGFR. I'll talk a little bit more about those later, um, but those are, are measures for kidney function and they can actually define chronic kidney disease. So we'll, we'll get there. Um, anyway, so in this study, they, have, they followed these participants for almost five years. There were over 8,000 participants that they followed. And what they found is that kidney function itself was associated with mortality, meaning that if your kidney function went down, your mortality went up. We know this. Kidneys are important. Without kidneys, you are likely going to go into dialysis, and then ultimately you're going to pass because we need our kidneys. But what was interesting is that the low protein diet made no difference regardless of kidney function. So it's a little bit of a different spin on this topic. So now we're starting to talk about the low protein diet. But before I get into people with kidney disease and a low protein diet, let me actually just mention this. There was one other meta-analysis that I pulled because it was just a, it was big, 28 articles, and it just clearly said that high protein intake does not adversely influence kidney function in healthy adults. Just hands down, let's stop worrying about it. Okay. So now we need to talk about people that actually do have some dysfunction of their kidneys, because this is actually really, really common. So I'm going to break this down a little bit. But before I do, if you're looking for more information on how to build out your bone health journey, and you haven't been to our masterclass, please come to our masterclass. It's free. You can find the link in the description on YouTube. We talk about the myths, misconceptions around bone health and about how to improve bone health. And we leave about 20 minutes for Q&A. I run these myself. I do them about every other week and I'd love to see you there. All right, so this next study really stood out to me because it's called Protein Restriction for Chronic Kidney Disease. Time to move on. <laughs> so let's talk about kidney disease. Let's talk about... Um, the protein restriction idea, because you'll see recommendations. People will tell you that, hey, if this is good for people with kidney disease, you should follow it now because you don't want to have kidney disease. They're really missing the point here. But let's talk a little bit about this protein restriction because it's really interesting. And, and clearly, I'm not a nephrologist. But because I talk about protein, because I want patients to build their bones, I have to understand these restrictions. And there is a time and a place for protein restriction, maybe, you'll see what I mean by that. Uh, but certainly I'm not telling anybody whose nephrologist has told them to restrict protein not. But let's look a little bit at these guidelines. So th the guidelines, these are called the KDOQI guidelines. These are from 2020 and they recommend protein restriction of 0.55 to 0.6 grams per kilogram. That's a, not a lot of protein. And that's for a low protein diet and then they go even lower for a very low protein diet. And they say that in metabolically stable chronic kidney disease stages three to five, I'm gonna explain those, they recommend those diets to reduce the risk of end-stage kidney disease and improve quality of life. Now, what's interesting is that the guidelines from a decade earlier were not nearly as strict, actually. And the um, recommendation was actually closer to the, the regular 0 0.8 grams per kilogram, which we know isn't enough to build muscle, but at least you can maybe hopefully maintain your muscle. I also think it's interesting, they talk about in this paper that in the United Kingdom, the uh, changes from the 2010 recommendations of nearly quote unquote normal protein recommendations, they actually went full uh, the opposite direction and said 0 0.8 to one grams per kilogram per day, um, even for stages uh, four and five of chronic kidney disease. So. You could see in the US, we took a very different angle. In the UK, they said, no, don't worry about it. 
this isn't going to make your kidney disease worse. You know, they already have these problems. So in this study, they go on to talk about how the evidence supporting protein restriction is limited and there's strong adherence issues, right? Like it's hard when you start limiting that, that amount of protein, you are really limiting what you can consume and you really eat a mostly carbohydrate diet, or at least most people would. And so it's just an interesting article written by nephrologists who say, look, we should probably not be doing this, but there is evidence to suggest that maybe we shouldn't just throw this all out. This 2020 meta-analysis actually showed that in some studies, there, there was benefit for those that do have severe kidney disease. So for people that had stage four or five, uh, going all the way into dialysis and eating dialysis, that protein restriction maybe did help. And I don't know the answer there. When somebody has... Um, stage four or five chronic kidney disease, then certainly we need to really respect what's happening with the kidneys because you don't want to be in dialysis. This is not a, uh, a good lifestyle. It's terrible for your bones. It's terrible for everything. So we definitely want to avoid that. So again, let me just back this up and say that if you have healthy kidneys, we don't need to worry about protein intake. If you have early chronic kidney disease, there's evidence to say that protein restriction is not going to slow you down um, it's not going to prevent you or slow you down from going from stages one, two, three into stage four and five. The only time when we worry about it is for people that do have stage four or five chronic kidney disease. Maybe there's a reason to restrict protein, although in the UK, apparently they don't. I don't know any nephrologist in the UK to verify that. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about chronic kidney disease and the definition, because a lot of people think that they actually meet this definition when they don't. So if you are concerned about your biomarkers, just hear me out here. So when we look at, at kidney labs, we're looking usually in blood. There certainly you can look in, in urine, but generally most docs are screening for kidney problems with blood. And in the blood, you're going to look at things like creatinine, and you're gonna look at EGFR. Most people don't say the E part, they just call it GFR, but it's not GFR. GFR stands for glomerular filtration rates, the, the speed that your kidneys or the parts of the kidneys are actually filtering your blood. In order to actually measure GFR, you need to do a very specific urine test that isn't done very often. The EGFR is estimating your GFR, and it can be very different from population to population. So it's not a great test. It's a good screening tool. But the definition of chronic kidney disease is a urine test that shows kidney damage specifically by spilling protein or something else that shouldn't be in the urine, in the urine, and a depressed or a low EGFR. If you just have a GFR that is below 65 or 60, and you, you see that one time, that doesn't mean that you have chronic kidney disease. It does mean you should probably make sure that that's either a blip or you, they get better or whatever. Um, but that person isn't in the same situation as somebody whose EGFR is low for a long period of time. Three months is the threshold by definition. So I just wanted to point that out because I do see people who mistakenly believe that they have kidney disease when they actually don't. All right, so let's wrap this up then. So high protein diets, what I consider an, an optimal protein diet, but what literature would call a high protein diet is actually associated with better odds of disease-free living. In someone who has normal kidney function, higher protein does not lead to an increase in chronic kidney disease. It does not lead to an increase in death. It does not lead to degradation of kidney function or any other negative from a kidney, from a metabolic perspective, from a cancer perspective, from an IGF-1 perspective, from an mTOR perspective. It doesn't have a negative in any of those things for adults that have adequate kidney function. Okay, so I, I hope that's totally clear. Now for those with chronic kidney disease, please talk to your doctors. Just also know that there is some discrepancy here. Other countries are doing different things than many other doctors are in the US. So you can always have this conversation with your doctor and say, hey, I know that my whatever kidney disease is at whatever level it is, but I also have osteoporosis. I also have sarcopenia, I've lost all my muscle mass and I want to try to build this back. I don't want to go down this other pathway. So can I increase my protein? Can we just watch my kidney function and see what happens? And then have that conversation and see if they're willing to walk that path with you. They very well may be because it isn't clear. It is not a, a crystal clear recommendation. 
uh, of what the outcome is going to be when it comes to protein restriction and chronic kidney disease. So everything has a risk benefit. Protein restriction is an intervention. You have to consider the risk benefit there. And lastly, remember that low protein diets will lead to sarcopenia and osteoporosis. You will lose muscle and bone. There's just no way around it. And if you have osteoporosis, you will not reverse it without eating adequate protein. You have to have the building blocks in order to build the thing that you're trying to build. You won't live longer if you avoid protein. You will get sarcopenic, you will eventually develop osteoporosis, and you will have fractures. And that is going to have a negative impact on your lifespan and health span, especially in the near term. So remember that a diagnosis of osteoporosis isn't the end, but deciding to reverse it is the beginning. I'll see you in the next video.